Okay, I'd like to welcome you all to Yogaflex Yoga School and we've got a very special class tonight. Uh, a lot of us may think that yoga is just about exercise, but it's a lot more than that. We, we capture your attention through the exercise and then uh, we bring along a whole lot of other information uh, which goes into the essence of uh, yoga and uh, Marcus will present that uh, as we go along. But I thought I'd start a little introduction, a couple of little stretches, and one of the relevant items. Yeah, we normally reserve this sort of stuff for yoga teacher training. It doesn't have to be, right? Uh, anybody can access this sort of information. Um, but the Yoga Sutras uh, are the definitive document on Patanjali, and nobody knows exactly when it was written. The sutras also do mention asana, uh, postures, right? but the, um, the more literal translation of asana is actually seated posture. Right? And uh, one of the first sutras is yoga chitta vritti virodaha, which means uh, yoga is the, is the cessation of the fluctuations of the mind. And another definition of yoga is the merging of individual consciousness with the universal consciousness. The asana, even though the postures are, you know, Pashimottanasana or Trikonasana or Uttanasana, the literal meaning is seated posture. And uh, my, my little take on that is all the postures are there to teach us how to sit quietly. Yeah, these are some of the books that uh, we use in yoga teacher training. Uh, the Iyengar book, Light on Yoga. Uh, a few other Iyengar books, uh, Yoga Anatomy book. Here's a, a version of the sutras of Patanjali, but we'll be focusing on this one, which Marcus, uh, I believe, edited. All the asana that we do, eventually you'll get to a point where you might be able to get into full notice, and that's when we really get comfortable. Uh, but initially, uh -uh. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's a very unnatural position. Uh, but the energetic benefits are there and just the position of it uh, pushes the spine upwards from the lower back and so once you can get to the stage where you can sit like this for an hour you're getting somewhere. Okay so I've covered my little introduction and um, I'd like to get Marcus to take yeah. a hot seat here. Okay. The way I want to run this is I'm going to explain things as we go, but I want people to want it to be more of a con uh, conversation rather than me just offering a lecture. So, at any time that someone wants to jump in, do so. Um, we're recording it, so uh, I think the microphone picks me up. So, when you do jump in, speak up. So, catches it. Uh, the second thing I want to say is that this is pretty deep stuff. It's, uh, it's one of the recognised philosophical traditions of India. So it's complex. Uh, there's a lot of belief structure in there. Right? There's a world view involved. Now, I'm not advocating anything. I'm just, just telling you what's in there. Uh, I've got my own ideas. I'm sure everyone's got their own ideas. It's a matter of just being informed to what these people call. Right? Very old tradition, a couple of thousand years old. Um, the book itself, uh, published by a friend of mine uh, who was my first genuine meditation uh, teacher. He never taught professionally, it was just an informal thing. Uh, he was a World War II vet from uh, New Zealand, fought in the, fought in the war, uh, uh, was uh, injured in the war at one stage, came back to New Zealand, couldn't settle down went to Sydney to live. There he came across yoga 
uh, and this was in the um, uh, early 50s, 1950s, and became very interested. And at the time, there was not much literature around. There were, there were very few texts in English that you could get your hands on, and uh, they were um, contradictory. Uh, he, as a young child, had, uh, had learned um, uh, Latin at school, and so he tackled Sanskrit, which has a very complex grammar, uh, and taught himself enough Sanskrit to read the text in the original. Now, he wasn't a Sanskrit scholar, but he was competent, but he'd also had been, by that, this stage, been practicing over for 25 years, uh, and could do everything, um, uh, and had also received some training uh, from uh, the first genuine yogi who turned up in Australia, used to, used to be called the, um, oh, but, um, huh, I've forgotten his name, it'll come to me, uh, and so he had a, a very good practical understanding, and so he, he, he then started making notes. Uh, translating the text, and he found that um, the way the text is translated in English it, it was very poor and in very crucial areas didn't reflect the text as it actually is. Uh, and that's, that's what led to the book. Now, he, uh, uh, he tried to get it published when he was alive, and uh, it, it didn't happen. After he died, um, I collected his notes and his manuscript, and over a year or so, because um, he kept on adding to it, uh, you know, refining his, his ideas, and it took about a year to bring it all together. So um, the, this follows the normal translations largely. It's, it's in, in agreement with most of the translations. Um, in the middle of it, though, it gets highly technical, uh, which we might get to. We'll see how we go tonight. Um, and that's the reason why this particular version has been published. Uh, but anyway, so that's the introduction. So now, I'll put my glasses on. Um, Yoga Sutra is in four, four um, large chapters. Uh, Samadhipada, uh, Sadhanapada, Vibhutipada, and Kivanapada. Uh, now, the first three parters basically give you the philosophy and, and the, um, um, the, the whole thing is, is it more or less explained in the first three parters. And it's fairly um, um, reasonably well accepted that uh, uh, it was first codified in, in written form about 2,000 years ago by this fellow who's known as Patanjali. Now, potentially just means, um, uh, from memory, uh, um, uh, something, I uh, 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 can't remember exactly now, but it's, it's not, not, there's no um, definite uh, idea of a historical personage. Potentially could be uh, just a name a person takes on. Uh, um, there, was, um, there was a famous potentially that, uh, uh, you know, um, wrote things like you know, dictionaries or something like that in, 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 in the tradition. Uh, but it's dated around 2,000 years ago, more or less. Uh, but the third, uh, the last um, part of the Kavalya part looks like it's an addition later because the language is a bit different, the grammar is slightly different, uh, and it looks like um, uh, somebody, possibly a 1,000 years later, has come along and wanted to um, clarify some things, add some things, because it was a, a living tradition and it was continuing to evolve. So, but the four the four texts are accepted as the basis for yoga. Now, it's Raja Yoga as opposed to Hatha Yoga. Hatha Yoga is the physical form, the physical practices, which is the pranayama and Hatha. Uh, the asana, uh, uh, asana's posture, pranayama's breathing, uh, and the uh, purpose of hatha yoga is to make the body fit for meditation. Uh, the raja yoga is the philosoph philosophical side. It's 
um, more about the mind and um, uh, a view of reality. There's a cosmology involved. Uh, and it's the philosophy that a person, the reason why somebody would do yoga in order to meditate, in order to come to a direct personal um, comprehension of reality. So it's a philosophy. You know? And it's quite uh, detailed. There's, you'll, when you go through it, as you read it, you, you can see that there's, um, although it's a particular thing in itself and it explains itself very well, it's possible to be oh, questioning, well, is that an influence that's getting from something else? Because the uh, Indian philosophies all developed simultaneously and there's a lot of cross-fertilization, a lot of internal argument, a lot of debate, and um, they all borrowed from each other. Right? Um, there's a sister philosophy to the uh, uh, Yoga Sutras called Shankya, uh, which is um, strictly a, um, uh, an, an analysis of reality, um, uh, trying to be scientific about it. You know, this is what we see. Uh, okay, what are those things made of? What are those things made of? Trying to resolve things back. Uh, and the yoga, um, Pat uh, the Patanjali Yoga Sutras and the Shankya are very closely aligned in their worldview. Uh, and there's a lot of, um, in, especially in the Shankya Pravakana, there's a lot of debate rejecting the ideas, the opposing ideas of other philosophers. So it's a very tangled thing. All right? Okay, so now what I'm going to do is just start you off, go straight into the first the first um, sutra, um, because it's it's um, a, a fairly dense uh, um, word. Things are stated very simply, but there's a lot hidden in those statements. So what I thought I'd do is bring it alive a little bit. All right. So if you go to um, where it says samadhipada, all right. Okay. Now, and I'll just take you through. And like I say, jump in at any time. And also, we'll just go as far as we can. Uh, we won't try and do the whole book uh, unless no one's really interested. We'll race through it. Uh, and we'll just see how far we get until we want to call it a, a day. All right? Does that sound good? Yeah? All right. Okay, so it starts off. I, I, won't, use the, I won't read the Sanskrit. So it starts off now an explanation of yoga will remain. Well, that's just a, a formal a formal thing in typical in Indian, Indian literature that whenever a, a, a text is presented they tell you up front, well, this is what we're talking about. No, it's just a, a simple statement of fact, this is about yoga. Okay, then straight away into the definition. Uh, and uh, George quoted to the yoga sitta viti naroda. Yoga is stopping the mental formations. Okay, now that's crucial to understand the whole practice of what, what you're trying to achieve. You know? It's how you judge your progress and all the rest of it. And there's a lot of complicated explanations that people offer about what's going on here. Uh, uh, that um, People imagine all kinds of things of what that might mean. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's to get right into the nitty-gritty, you've got a parallel set of um, uh, um, uh, practices with Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism, particularly not the Mahayana, Theravada Buddhism, and the yoga, where they share a lot of commonality in their techniques, and the final meditative state is identical. It's a kind of a trance state. It's, a, uh, it's literally suspended animated state. You know, where a person, um, everything stops, including awareness of your surroundings, awareness of yourself, it just goes, uh, no, no, no conscious experience at all. Even and the, the breathing. Uh, hmm? Even the breathing. Even the breathing stops, correct. It's, it's, a, it's a very uh, um, unusual state. Uh, both yoga and Buddhism, uh, they call, in yoga it's called Niroda. In Buddhism, they call it Nirvana. Uh, what's interesting is that both philosophies completely disagree about what it means. 
They have totally opposite views. In um, the cosmology of yoga is that we have a self, a witness of the mind. It's, it's all about trying to see, well, okay, what am I? That's the great Hindu question, what am I? And yoga says, well, I'm a self, an abiding self, and I witness my mind. And the whole purpose of meditation is to see that directly, to see that, oh, I'm not, um, I'm not my mind, I'm something which sees my mind. And that, that therefore means I have, a, in, a, in our parlance, a soul, something which is, has incarnated and will possibly incarnate again, and it's possibly incarnated before. But I am a being. Right? Now, Buddhism takes that same experience and say, well, because lights out, you know, you disappear, there is no you. Right? So it's a, it's a conundrum there. Right? So um, does uh, this believe in a separate self? Yeah, an, okay. indivi an individual self. An individual, like an individual soul? Yes. Okay. Um, and where it's aligned to the Shankya, the Shankya, uh, when it analyzes the, the cosmos, says, well, there's two principles. There's the material and there's the immaterial. Uh, Prakriti, the nature, energy, anything physical, anything material. And the immaterial is the consciousness principle. And what it's basically saying, that's kind of universal, but the consciousness has individualized. Just the same way as um, some energy, some energy can be a rock, some energy can be a, uh, you know, a liquid of some sort. The material can be distinct and individualized. Mm -hmm. That philosophy has it that so 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 with consciousness, and as human beings, we we express a highly individualized state. We have personality. We have a sense of self. We have will. We have comprehension. You know, uh, we have the power to perceive, and and each of us is clearly distinct from each other. We're individualized, and so that's the cosmology underlying the yoga practice. Now, what the uh, um, Raja yoga is about, it's all about okay. Well, how would you test that? How would you possibly come to a decision which was right? And so it's all uh, it's all about well. These are the steps that you know, that you need to embark on to see for yourself whether that's true or not. Now, it's a, you know, I don't interfere in anybody else's point of view. Everyone's got their own outlook, and that's as it should be. Um, so all I'm doing is presenting what yoga says. All right? So now on to the next one. Uh, so when the, the just to repeat, yoga is the stopping of mental form formations. So the next one, the next sutra, number three, then the witness abides in his own true spirit nature. So it's saying, okay, if you witness the mind, right, if the mind is something that you're looking at, uh, like you've got the, the five senses come in and the mind processes that, produces a, a, an image, creates an experience which you are witnessing. When the mind is brought to a stop, it's no longer active. Well, what's left? You. Right? So it's, it's, it's making this claim that if you uh, stop the mind, you then uh, place yourself in a position where you might actually gain some direct experience of you. Right? Okay, there's a so, problem here. So, so back to the, the mental formations. Mm. That they are the, the busyness of the mind. That are, Anything. That are all the stuff that you had so you, of. Yeah, uh, you open your eyes, you see stuff. So the mental formations of, of what you're trying to. Um, yeah, all. all, all so sort of uh, make still. Um, another way of saying whatever you perceive, your perceptions. Yeah. Now those perceptions might be your own thinking, they might be the light, they might be what you hear, might be what you feel, what you taste. These are perceptions presented in the mind. They're the formations. Right. Uh, um, uh, formations being that it it, it moulds, it changes, or it becomes a thing. 
You know, uh, especially like a good example is when you dream. Right? When you dream, you create a world in your mind. Right? Well, that's a formation, a formation of the mind, of the mental stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So you want to bring that to a stop. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one of the interesting um, uh, elements of this is uh, the Sankhya Yoga, which is the ancient form, uh, uh, defines uh, existence in, uh, like you say, two uh, two um, elements. Uh, one is spirit, and the other one is nature. And spirit is the non is the immaterial, and nature is the material. And you can say that spirit is that which knows but cannot walk, whereas nature is that which walks but cannot know. Okay. Right? It's, it's an interesting distinction. And then the question comes up, well, where does the mind fit? Is it part of spirit or is it part of nature? What do you think? Is it, is it, is it material or is it Is it, is it possibly spirit? the, the, the Sorry? Known, is it the, like the novel connection between the spirit and the nature, perhaps? Uh, not quite. It's right. um, you know you got you got spirit which is immaterial and you've got nature with which is material, and so where does the mind sit? Good question. In the middle. <laughs> That's well, not bad. Well, but what's interesting? Well, what do you think? Do well, you think? I'm going to put that on pause because that does get um, dealt with, but you're jumping ahead. So, okay, well, we'll leave it, yeah, yeah because yeah. it's a very interesting answer. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. So that's actually um, really central to the whole thing. Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay, so at the, at the moment, what we've, all, in the first researchers, we're basically confronted with the claims the philosophy makes. Right? And they're all unproven at the moment. It's just what it states, this is reality. Okay. Now, number four, it says, okay, otherwise, there is assimilation of the witness into these formations of the mind. Now, in simple language, uh, if the mind's busy, you're just drawn into that activity and you identify with it. You know, that's, you know, that's life, that's who you are, that's what it's, it is. you don't make a distinguishing, you don't distinguish, you just are, and, and which is as it should be. You wouldn't want it any other way. Right? Okay. Not while you're driving. Hmm? Not while you're driving. Uh, no. Um, uh, if you black out while you're driving, everyone's at risk. Mm. Okay. Okay, now. So now we're get, starting to get in. Um, this, is, this is where you see simple statements, and they hide a lot. So we're starting to get into the psychology of the, of the thing. And it's quite, uh, quite important to get a grasp of it. Otherwise, you start to get lost. So, the formations of the mind are of five kinds. Either painful or not painful. So, it's starting now to um, talk about the, the, um, just the experience of life. Right? There's things you want, things you don't want, all the rest of it. Now, you, all along the way, you're going to see the parallels here with Buddhism. Uh, in the Buddhist texts, they talk about that before the Buddha went off with his own teaching. Prior to that, he had studied yoga under two, two uh, teachers, but was dissatisfied with what he, uh, he found. Um, uh, the yoga texts, uh, the uh, Buddhist texts um, have it that uh, both teachers were very pleased with him. They wanted, each of them wanted him to be his, their successor. So clearly he's, as in, the, in the yoga teacher's ideas, uh, he uh, uh, had succeeded in understanding fully what he was being taught. But the Buddha wasn't happy. No? There was more. You know. Now, in this text here, you, you can see that this is um, very similar to Buddhism. Buddhism uh, is about um, recognizing that suffering that we can experience, but that suffering which we created for ourselves and can therefore avoid. Right. Uh, now, yoga's got a very similar thing. It's talking about um, formations of the mind, and they can. Uh, there are five kinds, and they're either painful or not painful. Yeah. So then we're on to the next one. Sorry, is it samsara? Samsara. Yeah. yeah. 
Sim, só... Oh, se for Oh, se for a sua boa That kind of uh, encapsulates more of the, um, it's a, the reincarnation cycle. Buddhism's a multi-headed hydra, right? Um, um, there are a lot of there are a lot of very good translations of samsara. To take it away from any particular tradition, the the nicest one that I've ever seen, samsara is translated as the wandering. And we wander through existences, through life. You know, it's, the samsara is the wandering. You know? um, so it's it's not not got a bad connotation at all. Uh, it, it's it's not, not as if it's something which is. Uh, uh, miserable, it's, it could be an adventure or it could be a, a, a terrible journey, you know, it's a wandering. Uh, it, it's, it's more, more along, the, along the lines of um, experiencing but not comprehending. Yeah? Uh, and uh, uh, how it's used in, in Buddhism, well, um, depending on which kind of Buddhism you're talking about, uh, uh, but life is... Buddhism is... is it's, it's been charged with this, doesn't like hearing this, but Buddhism is um, essentially life denying because it's all about escaping. Right? Yoga doesn't have a view like that. It's, it, it's, it, it doesn't go down that way at all. Um, life is. Right? Um, it's, it's not necessarily something you want to escape, it's something you want to comprehend. Right? Uh, uh, and it's still the same term, samsara. Right? How's that? Good. I was just wondering as well, how, does this kind of fit with that or not? I mean, you explained how uh, Buddhism is kind of life escaping where this is life is, but is the um, this last one, uh, you know, the kind of painful or not painful and being kind of uh, really involved in your experience, is that a little bit like samsara? Is that what you were saying? Oh, like no, samsara, you know? samsara is, is the existent as we experience it. Uh, and um, we might find it sometimes pleasant, sometimes unpleasant. Um, and it's talking specifically about the psychology, so the formations of the mind, how you perceive it. Okay, well, different people perceive the same thing differently. You know, uh, some people like corn, some people don't. You know. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a subjectivity about it. Um, this, uh, this is what I'm saying that the, the, the first part of the Yoga Sutra is trying to give you a, a psychological um, um, outlook. There's a lot of psychology in this. Before you get down to the nuts and bolts of just meditation practice, it's, it's, um, it it's initially starts to talk about um, the limits of the mind and uh, the parameters by which we live. And, and the, term, the terminology is formations. Well, you know, you could swap out, swap out that for, uh, for perception, you know, mm -hmm. how we perceive things. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Right. Still good? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. You could also throw in um, the, the illusion part of it, uh, the maya. Oh, that comes, where, that comes. Um, <laughs> where uh, your senses that you were mentioning before, uh, your perception, right? It's actually lying to you. Ah, right? uh, yeah, we don't see reality as it actually is. We see it as, as yes, we perceive it. Yes, it's part of the journey that we go, we go through yeah. to reach enlightenment. Ah, enlightenment is another word. The, uh, just as, as an aside, yeah. there's a tortured history for the word enlightenment. Um, once again, we've got Buddhism to thank. We've got um, uh, the first translations of the Pali Canon were done by a German fellow. Um, Muller, I forget his for proper name, but I'm bad with names. Um, I think the 1700s or 1800s, and it was German, and he came across a, a Buddhist phrase, and he was looking for a German word. And I don't know what the German word was, but he used that to translate the, 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 the text. And then when it was translated into English, it was translated as enlightenment. Right. Now, is that a good translation or not? I don't know. Right. But we now have a concept of enlightenment, which maybe is just a, a concept. There's maybe just a fictitious idea that there's such a thing as enlightenment. And, and there's a whole lot of connotations that we have with it, which may or may not be real. 
um, which is illusion, possibly. Mm. All right? It's complex, this stuff. And this is actually, we're only up to the fifth sutra, right? There's a couple of hundred in here, right? A hundred and something of it. All right. So now we're on to the next one. They are correct knowledge, mistaken idea, fancy, sleep, and memory. They're the five kinds that yoga is asserting. Uh, and, and so basically it's setting itself up to then explain these one by one. All right, so the next one, correct knowledge. Knowledge related to facts is based on direct perception, inference, or testimony. All right, now, you can skip over that, but it's actually quite important. Because it's basically saying, okay, well, how do we know what we know? And what, what things are we going to say constitute reality that will take us, that we can rely on? So, like, for instance, we've got the scientific method now, where we know something's true because we can repeat it. Uh, I can make an experiment and get a result, and somebody in some other place, far away from me, in some other time, can do that same experiment and get the same result. So, okay, we're going to agree that's real, right? And that's the scientific method. So that so that would be um, uh, uh, direct perception, all right? Then we don't do these experiments and we think, well, this is true, and because this is true, well, oh, that explains that, and that explains this, all right? Uh, so that's inference based on well, we've established that's true, and because that's true, this is true. And then the last one is testimony, where some famous scientist says, well, I got this experiment, and no one else has done it yet, but it's true. Well, I believe you, you know, because you're a reliable character. So what yoga is saying, that uh, what constitutes knowledge, is your own perception, what you can infer from that, and what you might be reliably told by someone else. That's, so it's giving itself the basis upon which it's making a foundation for what later comes. It's, this is a, philosoph a philosophical work and it's trying to you know, cover its ass, basically. All right, all right. so now, um, all good? Okay, so next one. Mistaken idea is erroneous impression not based on the real form of the thing. Now, there's a little explanation given to this, and it's a very famous one in yoga and in Hinduism in particular. You're walking along and you see a snake in the grass. And then you look closely the second time, oh, no, it's just a picture of it. Right? Uh, the other one that they use a lot is you're walking on the beach and you see this shiny object. I found some silver. No, no, it's just a seashell. Now, there's some real subtlety hidden in this, which is not apparent if you just say, oh, yeah, okay, that sounds right. It's actually talking about the way the mind works. But what happens when you perceive something? You perceive it as a series of images, and they're discrete images, which you then overlay and form a, um, a, um, an amalgam of. Now, a good analogy, is the, uh, a movie, right? And when black and white movies came out, I think they ran out somewhere 30 something frames a second, 32 frames a second, I'm not quite sure. Mm -hmm. Now, and recently, you know, they've changed that now, a lot of stuff is at 60 frames a second. And what happens if you watch a movie at 60 frames a second, you get this sense of hyper reality, like it's really quite vivid. You run it at 32, okay, it's a movie, you know, the images, you see everything in motion. If you run it at 15 or 12, you see it's jerky and you see it. You, now, that's, that's because our brains have a processing speed. We process somewhere around 45 frames a second, 50 frames a second. You know, we process our experience as a, as a series of images, which we then, you know, pop, 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 and we get. So, if, that's why you can have this illusion. You, you see something and you mistake it for something. But you look more closely and you build up a body of experience and then you see it more clearly. So there's a lot of subtlety in this. And it's already started so, to talk... You're not just talking about the vision here, you're talking about 
the, the philosophical. No, philosophy. actually talking about how the mind works. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's like <clears throat> it can be not just seeing, you know, mistaking the rope for the snake is one thing, but perhaps you know on, on a wider scope would that be like you know mistaking some uh, political leader for being the right choice. Um, okay, um, that, know, that gets when into... When they were actually a snake? Uh, that, that's, that's, that's getting into the weeds, uh, right. yes, yes. Right. Uh, but what's, why it's getting into the weeds is because you're, getting, you're adding something. If you see something, but you take it to be something, yeah. which it isn't, yeah. what's, what's actually happened there, it's real, but you're perceiving it as, as something else. What you've actually done, you've projected onto it. Yes. You've projected your own on worldview onto it, right. Right? Uh, which is um, uh, um, um, that gets covered a little bit later. That that, that process. Right? So you can see what's going on here. That the Yoga Sutra is, is basically starting off with first an explanation. This is what what I am. Right? It's all about stopping the mind and seeing stuff. But before you can do that, you've got to then get a few definitions in. Okay, what is the mind? What are its limits? What are the parameters that you're working with? So that's what's actually going on here. Right? It's it's stated very simply, but there's a lot hidden in it. Right? Okay. Um, an image conjured up by words devoid of objectivity is fancy, which is what you were just talking about. That um, oh, he's a nice guy, you know, uh, but not really, you know. Uh, but you can or um, your imagination. Uh, you, you might want something to be true, and so you conjure the view uh, and call it real. But it's it's fanciful, right? and so yoga is trying to say, "Well, this is what we do. This is part of what you've got. This is your starting point, and it's all part of the really early stages of the definition of the philosophy." All right, still good. Keep going. Yeah. All right. Well, one of the fascinating things about uh, the mind and the imagination mm -hmm. is, and we use it in the yoga classes. Say, say we do a uh, a rowing your boat um, action like this, and even though there's no boat and there's no water and there's no oars, you end up getting strong. <laughs> right? That's the fascinating thing. Uh, right? So your imagination can affect your reality. Yes, <clears throat> that's 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 a key point. All right. Um, okay. Absence of the basis of cognition is the formation of sleep. Okay. So it's it's already said. Well, sleep's one of the, one of the formations, and it's trying to give a definition. Is it a good one? I don't know. But anyway. Uh, so uh, next one. Memory is not allowing a thing once cognized to escape. So once again, it's just giving itself a formal background, a formal set of definitions. All right. Um, to establish the psychology of what, what's going on. Um, practice and the cultivation of detachment leads to the suppression of the thought formations. Okay, so this is the first advice on meditation practice. But, uh, and once again, there's a lot hidden in there. Uh, just to read it again more slowly. Practice and the cultivation of detachment leads to the suppression of the formations. Now, the psychology there is we are we're thoroughly identified with our experience. Right? So the um, remedy is to be a little bit detached from it, because what you're trying to do, you're not necessarily just trying to see reality; you're trying to see yourself, and you're trying to be objective when you're thoroughly a subjective thing. Right? So you're trying to gain some kind of um, perspective, uh, contrast. So you're trying to be a bit more... Distance? Distance. Detached, not, not, not immersed. There's a lovely, lovely saying in Sufism. Uh, the last creature in the world which will ever know water is a fish. Uh, and that's that's the same thing with our mind. Uh, so that's what it's trying to say. This is the beginning then of the yoga. Now we're saying into the meat of meditation. Uh, and and so it set up the psychology and 
in order to explain, okay, so you need to detach yourself from these things. No? Okay. Um, okay. Of the two, right, so we just said you know, practice and cultivation of detachment. Of the two, the more important is the effort to practice, to become firmly established. Now, so human psychology is unchanged. We'd love to find the back door to heaven, right? but there isn't one. Uh, if you find one, let me know. Um, so it's really emphasising this is a practical endeavour. Right? Uh, and in that way it starts to distinguish itself from a faith. Right? It's not, oh, I believe this, therefore. It's really insistent that this is something you can do and get a personal, direct um, insight into from your own effort. Right? Okay, so, um, yeah, number 14, Sutra 14, we're up to 14. Uh, yet that effort must be sustained for a long time, sincerely, and without interruption to become firmly grounded. Okay, just like anything. Yeah? Yeah? All right. Now, ceasing to crave for objects seen or heard about, by the act of will and due to understanding is viragya, detachment or dispassion. So, once again, we're talking about psychology. Um, it's not saying there's anything bad in these things. There's no negative, oh, this is bad, this is, can't do that. It's just a statement of fact that if you are craving something, if you must have it, right, well, you can't step back and just look at it. Right? And just telling us, just in plain, plain language, that okay, if you're going to follow this, then you have to, with an act of will, um, consciously be aware. Okay, well, recognize when you, when you, the, the things you're attached to, and it doesn't say that's bad. It doesn't say that you can't do it. It's just alerting you. Well, if you want to see things objectively, then you're going to have to step back a bit. All right. There's, there's very little moralizing in, in the in the in the in the, uh, in the sutra. Okay, uh, the highest viragya. Viragya. I'm not sure how would you say viragya. Am I saying it well? Viragya. Um, yeah. V a i r a g y a. I pronounce it viragya, but I'm sure it's badly pronounced. I think it's viragya or something like that. Yeah. Like what? Uh, I could have it wrong. Viragya. Mm, okay. It may be I've got the wrong word. <laughs> okay, so the highest, I'll, I'll keep mispronouncing, I'll you know, make a mess of it. The highest fragment is that in which, on account of the discernment of the Purusha, the indwelling self, there is freedom from even the least desire of the gunas. The gunas are the three modes of nature's activity. Okay, that's very complex, that one. First off, it's making an assertion. Right? It's saying, well, there is a Purusha. Right? Well, we haven't actually established that, but it's saying there is. Okay, and it's saying that the highest detachment is when you see yourself, oh, well, I'm, although I'm a physical being, and I'm living in this world, and I've got my needs and I want my wants, I'm a spiritual being. And that's the essence of all I am. So this philosophy is saying, well, when you, once you see that, the uh, automatic attachment to things is lessened or maybe even absent, because this is discernment of the self. Right? And it talks about the three gunas. Now, the three gunas are a really tricky topic. Um, the, I, don't, I, I don't have a grasp of it. Um, I know that the gunas crop up across Hindu philosophy all over the place. Um, the gunas, because this is a psychological, uh, psychological um, Treatise. Um, the gunas are, um, are more mental factors, factor, factor, so three of us, uh, Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. Right? Um, Rajas is the highly energetic, Tamas is the inertial, you know, leave me alone, I've had enough, and Sattva is the um, um, uh, clarity, the, the you know, refined. Right? 
Now, an interesting little thing I only came across the other day. In mathematics, they've got a mathematical game where they, they imagine a tree it produces a seed and uh, when, when the, the seed, when, when you get two identical trees, the game ends. So if you've got a tree with only one attribute, the game ends straight away. As soon as it makes a, a tree of itself, it, uh, it game's over. With um, two um, um, uh, types of tree, types of seed, you can get, I think, six different types of tree and the game, game's over. Once you've got a tree with three different seeds, and it can make all these patterns, the patterns are close to infinite. Right? It's, uh, you only need three ingredients to, to create um, uh, such diversity that it, it's more atoms in the universe. Um, another way of understanding the gunas, you can understand in terms of the th three primary colours. Right? You've got red, blue and yellow. Right? But from those three colours, you can make an, an enormous number of colours. So you've got these three prior aspects of the reality, but how they mix determines the uh, what you end up with. So they're the gunas, you know? uh, but it's more complex than that, and I'm not sure it's actually particularly uh, like it does my head in. So I don't know. Um, so is it is it suggesting that we that the cell in um, you know, in, in observing the, the, um, the sort of still mind is kind of in, is that like, are you in some control of the, of the ratio of those goodness? I mean, oh. that, are you, you know, are you able to say, for example, uh, I, I, wish, I wish to experience less inertia. Um, okay, or, or, well, or, or, you, or, or more of the, um, you you basically jump you know, towards the stuff. You, uh, there's certain claims that yoga makes, uh, which are fantastic, meaning they're very very hard to believe, right? And I personally don't believe them. Right? Uh, surely the idea of, of of the observant self is is that a kind of a, a seeker? Isn't it sort of a, you know, uh, a no, I think of I, an evolution? I think I might have confused things a bit. Right. Um, uh, the, the simple statement is that yoga is saying there's a self which witnesses. And right. what it witnesses is the, the, the manifestation of the three gurus, the reality. Right. Yeah? right. Um, what it does make claim about later on uh, in the Vibhuti part, which is... Um, about the powers of yoga, or the fruits of yoga, or the, you know, um, you know, the, the richness of yoga, is that um, a person, a yogi, uh, once they start to see reality directly, um, gains a certain kind of mastery of uh, reality. Um, there, I suspect, personally I suspect we're getting a lot of influences coming in, which aren't necessary, you know, but they're, they're in the yoga, it's what the yoga claims, you know, um, and you know, some some things might be true. I don't know, you know? Um, but that's towards the end of the book. <laughs> right. uh, um, okay. Are we all good so far? Mm -hmm. no. Okay. No worries. We 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 all good so far. Yeah. 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 Happy to keep going for a while. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So the highest rank is that. Uh, just repeating that. That in which, on account of the discernment of the Purusha, the indweller self, there is freedom from even the least desire for the Guna. So, once you perceive yourself as you are, the 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 um, um, fascination for things uh, is is you're not captured by it because uh, you, you're no longer identifying with it. You, you're, dis, you're discerning yourself as uh, as you are involved in it, but not of it. You know? uh, so there's a psychology. There's a psychology of the thing. Because um, going back a bit, referring back, talking about things can be either painful or not painful. Well, they don't have to be either. Uh, 
that's how you that's how you uh, end up experiencing things. But that's how you experience things when you're fully identified with what you're experiencing. So once again, it's a cosmology. It's a, it's a philosophical outlook here. You know, this is this is a philosophy, one of the competing philosophies in Indian, Indian philosophy you know, uh, and world philosophy in general. So, okay. Now, now we're getting onto a new theme: uh, the different kinds of meditation. We're starting to get into the meat of the topic now. We're, we're, we've got, we've done the introduction, we've done the groundwork. Now we're starting to talk about meditation itself. All right. So samprajnata is that process of reasoning, argument, and deliberation, which is accompanied by pleasure, interest, and self-enjoyment. So it's basically talking about, you're not quite into meditation yet, you're, talk, you're talking about, okay, when you take an interest in something, just because you're interested, you, you find a pleasure in it. Uh, and you get into thinking about it, you want to, you want to see how it works, you want to see what it does, you want to, you know, that's samprajnata. So all of this there, once again, we're still defining terms. It's explaining one of its key terms, which again gets used in context later. Some Prajnata. Right. Okay. Uh, Sutra 18. The remnant impression, subconscious impression, samskara sasha, left in the mind, on the dropping of deliberation after previous practice of it, is the other i.e. yoga as, a, as distinct from reasoning and deliberation. Okay, now we're talking about meditation. Right. So what is just said there, Samprajnata, you take an interest in something, you investigate it, you think about it actively, right. you come across something you study perhaps or want to learn, and then comes a point when you put it aside, right. as you do. You go have something to eat or go on to something else for the time being. You know, you've done what you want to do for the time being. Okay, that activity, the Sambhajnada, the active interest, leaves behind a remnant impression, a memory, an influence. You've subtly set things, you've set the cogs going in the mind. So it's, it's really talking about the subconscious activity which occurs after active thinking. Right? And so that's the um, remnant impression. Right? Now that becomes a very important thing later on in some of the meditation practices. Uh, yoga has this view, um, there are various, um, um, they view uh, incarnation as, okay, it's a spirit in a body, but it's not quite as simple as that. There's a physical body, there's the energy body which drives the physical body. There's the mental body, the mind. Uh, uh, and there's a higher intelligence, the buddhi. There's the manas, the incarnation of the buddhi. Right? This is the mind, this is the body. And there's the witness, that's all these things are the vehicle. So it's saying that, okay, you consciously take an interest in something, the mind works, you maybe learn something, and the, the buddhi is being suddenly changed, and there's a remnant impression in that, and becomes a subconscious thing. And you continue to think about these things subconsciously. You know, and perhaps you've got a problem, you don't work out the answer, you're walking down the street one day, sitting on a park bench, comes to you. Well, how did that happen? It's because you were still thinking about it somewhere deep in the mind. And then when a resolution of whatever it is that you've been puzzling over comes to you, is presented consciously in the mind, in the, in the mind that you can witness directly. So that's the yoga view of the mind and the activity of the mind. Right? And it's key to understanding its meditation practices, why what it's doing is meditation. Right? It's not some weird, strange exercise that you're trying to you know, go off and levitate later. You know, it's, 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 it's quite direct and very grounded in reality, in, into how we experience things. Right? Okay, so over the page, this is what we've got here. Uh, well, actually, there's a lot of uh, common, uh, the author has gone to a lot of trouble here to uh, uh, to explain this because it's quite an important thing. So we might, be just, might just read a bit of it. So his commentary to this is we enter here into the deeper areas of yoga, yogic understanding of the mind. 
It is the first description given in the Yoga Sutra of Samyama, yogic concentration. For a long age, the experts in yoga have understood that we do not do all of our thinking with the perceptible surface of the mind. When people of good intelligence, after brooding over a matter, for some time there occurs spontaneously suspension of the trans uh, of the mental transformations. And that's actually an interesting sentence. We do actually suspend the mind automatically, all the time. When you're watching, say, a, a documentary on TV, right, and you can't record it, you're watching it, you pay attention, you stop thinking. If you get involved, oh, that's an interesting thing, blah, 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 you wake up off our What did he say? Right? The last 10 minutes, you missed it because you were, you, your attention was focused on your own thoughts. So, how did you listen to, how did you take it in? It's because you suspended your own thinking. Right? You do it all the time. It's actually very, very natural. Right? All that's happening with yoga is that you're refining that and taking, you mastering that process with you, uh, an act of will and, and derivation and practice. So you, you're actually aiming to um, improve the, the gestation of your thoughts? No, um, uh, um, I mean, that probably would be a side benefit, right. but it's not what you're aiming for. Uh, what, what you're really aiming for is this really high aim of, well, what the fuck am I? Uh, what am I? And to see it directly, if it's possible. And yoga's making a claim that it is. Is it real? You don't know. You've got to find out. Right? Uh, and there's lots of competing views. Uh, this is just one philosophy. Right? Okay. Uh, so, I've, I've, if people of good intelligence, I'll just continue with his commentary because it's quite to the point. In people of good intelligence, after brooding over a matter for some time, there occurs spontaneously suspension of the mental transformations, though without distraction from other thoughts. And during the suspension, the practice of co uh, cognition is actually passed onto a higher function of the mind. Now, all our thinking mainly is unconscious. We, we, when we have a thought that we can actually, you know, say to ourselves in words, that's the end result of a process that's gone on we, can't, we don't see. Right? But it's, that's the intelligence, it's working. Mm. All right? Okay. Um, uh, most of the significant breakthroughs in science and philosophy have, have really been, been accomplished in this way. And therefore, it should be not. It should not surprise us that the supreme science of mind, Raja Yoga, is found to make deliberate use of such a process, technically termed samyama. All right. Okay. Diving deeper, it gets worse. All right. We go deeper and deeper into this. Is we're still just at the beginning stages of this stuff. Okay. Now, new thing. Now, I've skipped a lot of, a lot of tech, uh, in, in his book, there's a fairly detailed argument, technical argument, where he's arguing uh, why uh, that previous sutra was tra translated in ways which don't make sense. A lot of the tr translations are religious-based uh, and not necessarily accurate because people wanted to conform to what they want to be true. Right? Okay, now here, New theme, Sutra 19, and we're getting into the deep philosophy of yoga. Being born causes the bodiless ones to be buried in gross matter. Right. Now, for simplicity, I'm just going to read his commentary because he explains what he wants to say here pretty carefully. That sounds terrible. Doesn't it? <laughs> Doesn't it? <laughs> but it's true. Okay, the Buddhists might be right. Okay, here we have five words only arranged in two Sanskrit compounds. Presumably the sutra means just what it says. A birth cause of the bodiless ones being absorbed into the prakirti, the prakirti purusha, right? That was explained before. Um, uh, uh, presumably gross nature, since birth and rebirth is in question. Right? So yoga believes in reincarnation. Uh, but this is just one line in many. Uh, in understandable English, which would be nice. 
Being born causes the bodiless, bodiless ones to be buried in gross matter. This defines the process of incarnation, reincarnation, the physical embodiment of a Purusha. Literally, one is temporarily buried alive in matter. Right? Now, vidya means bodies. Uh, uh, I might skip the. So, between, uh, thereby, between incarnations, do we get to en enjoy being free of this? Oh! Uh, okay, well, once again, the. Uh, um, sort of quick out of one and straight into well, the other one, uh, not yoga, again. Yoga, yoga identifies. Uh, uh, sheaths of, ex of bodily existence, right. of which matter is the grossest form, yeah. but it is energized by an energy body. Right. Now, uh, if you believe that there is uh, um, an astral plane, some people believe there's an astral plane, if that was true, you would, in it would inhabit as an energy body still be incarnated into some... Yeah. In, in some um, the basic philosophy here is that um, consciousness doesn't exist separate from some kind of physical form. It always has some physical form. It, it doesn't make any sense unless that there is... And the finest form that the, that the you know, Purusha inhabits is the mind. Right? Right? But uh, it, it, there's uh, yoga, talking about yoga, believes that there's an energy body, there's a, an incarnation mind, and then there's a higher intelligence which rules that. And then there's a Purusha, which is the indwell of that. Right? Um, this is the basic reasoning of yoga. Right? yoga. Yoga actually has a philosophy. Well, not only is it saying this is what life is, but it says, well, why? What's the purpose? Right? Now, the purpose of being, from yoga's point of view, of being physically incarnate, is that your actions now have consequences which you have to experience. If you, some people like to do lucid dreaming, right? Okay, lucid dreaming, suddenly you wake up in the dream, oh, and there's a whole reality there created, oh, let's go for a fly, now let's fly, or let's walk through that wall. Something you can't physically do, but you can do it in the, in the dream world. If you try to do that in the physical world, you're going to hurt yourself. Why would you do it in the physical world? Well, if you try to do it in the physical world, there's something wrong with how you perceive things. You don't actually understand your own mind. You don't see its limits. You don't understand the reality. You're going to cause yourself injury. You're probably, almost certainly, going to cause others injury. And why? Because you don't perceive your own mind. And why not? Because there are no consequences. In a dream world, there are no consequences. So how can you see, oh, well, that's real and that's not. Because there's no concept, nothing's, everything's whatever it is, whatever you want it to be. So the purpose, as far as yoga is concerned, of incarnation is, okay, you're a spiritual being, you have intelligence, you have comprehension, you have will, but you need to understand it. You need to master it. You need to be able to perceive reality. And... Physical reality allows that because everything you do has a consequence which impacts on you. And so you learn by experience. And this is yoga's view of what life is for. The purpose of, of physical incarnation. And at some point, uh, when a person is fully conscious, fully aware, fully self-aware, maybe still growing, right? Uh, there's no, no uh, um, suggestion there's any end point in this. It's just talking about the way things are for us. But, okay, perhaps there comes a point where you don't need these corrective measures. You know, that um, uh, you might enter a dream world and know it's a dream world. Uh, uh, that um, uh, George mentioned before about illusion and delusion. Self-delusion is the greatest difficulty we have. We're self-deluded a lot. Well, without consequences, it's hard to see how you would ever get out of that state. So that's what yoga is. That's the cosmology of yoga. The purpose of life is for each person 
to understand their own mind. So that's why it's a meditation practice as well. It's 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 very diverse. It's not um, you know uh, uh, it's not um, it's not a simple philosophy by any means. All right, keep going. But it's not it's not trying to sell anybody any um, sort of idea of um, uh, of an overwhelming day. Oh, it's got elements of like yeah, no, it does. It doesn't do that. No, it does have that in it as well. It does have that. In yeah. It, right? um, it's a take it or leave it. Right. right? Um, um, it's it's a it's a world view. This is why I said at the beginning I don't want to impose any. Uh, and some of this stuff I don't agree with myself. Right? I, and I think that's important. Every person's got to come to their own points of view based on their own experience of what they think right? and test it. Right? And if it works, it's real. Right? Um, uh, but one thing it doesn't do, it's not about, oh, you know, have faith and everything's going to be fine. This is a, um, there's a saying in uh, somewhere in the yoga literature that the yogi becomes his own defender. Uh, meaning, takes on full responsibility, self-responsibility. That, that's good. That, that I can definitely use. That's, uh, that, that's, that's, the, uh, that's one of the reasons yoga never became a state religion. And it's probably one of the reasons why yoga has actually been one of the better preserved philosophies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Buddhism got derailed because we had this emperor called Ashoka in the 3rd century BC, made it a state religion. Well, before he did that, there were actually a multitude of uh, schools of thought about what the Buddha taught. And he refined, no, 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 that's Buddhism, everything else, out of Right. Same thing that happened in Christianity with um, Constantine. The moment it became a state, and it was a vehicle, a political vehicle to control people. You know, get them to believe one thing, and then you're at the top of the religion, you tell them what to do. Yeah. Right. We're, we're, we're talking about a science here. Yes. And science does not have to be limited to three dimensions. Right? That's the big mistake of the modern technological world. It's trying to fit everything into three dimensions, and it can't be done. Uh, yeah, by, by realizing that uh, the potential of science is just astronomical. Well, anyway. um, it, it does claim to be um, a science of the mind, though that wouldn't be a term they would have used. It's not a bad way of looking at it. Okay, um, so leading on from this thing, just to repeat it, being born causes the bodiless ones to be buried in gross matter. In others, surely, uh, here, um, just to, before I read it, um, this is one of these areas where he found fault with the existing translations. Because there's a, a lot of superstition in, uh, that, uh, in, 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 the, in all religions. The Hindus aren't the only ones to blame for this. We're very, very superstitious creatures. And we make stuff up. Right? Okay, so, and he, he objected because when he read the sutra, the sorts of translations he'd come across and what he thinks he finds the sutra actually says, two different things. And so he's wording it very strongly. It's quite, quite confrontational on this matter. In others, surely those who will not be so reincarnated in bodies of flesh, yet surely deliver us from the same, is preceded by faith, energy, mindfulness, and samadhi prajna, the high knowledge that comes from samadhi. Okay, just to cut that down to something sensible. He's saying for those um, uh, who uh, uh, escape this being born, in, 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 you know, escape the, uh, the need for physical incarnation, uh, how that may have happened is that it was preceded by faith, energy, mindfulness, and samadhi prajna, or that understanding which comes from meditation practice. So Yoga Sutra is saying, okay, you meditate, you're going to get insight. And um, that's, um, that's part of the escaping this purpose. You, you fulfill your purpose, in other words. Right? Now, um, uh, keep going. How far, yeah. how far through the... Oh, know. all the way up to Sutra 21. And how many uh, uh, okay, if I went to the end of Samadhi Pada, we get to... Uh, it's, it's 51, 51, another 30. 
Well, we won't get through it, will we? We won't get through it. No. <laughs> not unless people, you know, um, you know want to not tonight, anyway. But not, not, not unless we want to watch the dawn. No. Uh, but it's a great introduction that you've uh, presented. Yeah. 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 Yes. Oh, it's, it's, it's a huge yeah. amount of stuff. It's quite a lot of old people. Yeah. yeah. Well, see, that's what I thought. Um, uh, you, uh, uh, um, I was very, very lucky. Right? I met uh, uh, Cornelius Johns. Everyone knew him was Colin. And I met him when I was 13, he was 56. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was interested in meditation. I, uh, I, um, uh, he was working for some people that uh, I was living by a shop in the Cross in Sydney. And uh, it took me ages to uh, you know, get to talk to him. Mm -hmm. And when, uh, when uh, uh, I did get to talk to him, I started asking him about this sort of stuff. And he was at this stage just working on the book. He had been you know, writing, writing the manuscript. Start, it was in some way into his book. Anyway, I started to pester him, you know, and uh, uh, he sort of looked at me. He was, on, he was the age man in the counter of the shop, and I'm on the other side. And he sort of looked down at me and he said, You were really interested in this stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right then. So um, he taught me my first meditation technique, mm. you know, genuine technique. And um, I, at some time, uh, I, when I next got the chance to see him, I told him, um, uh, yeah, I've been practicing. And I said, oh, I fell asleep. Well, he was so pleased. Because it meant I'd actually been trying to do it. Because when you try and meditate, you fall asleep. Yeah. You know? And um, so uh, over, the, over the time, I, I knew him for, oh, how many years? A bit over 20 years, just over 20 years. And the first dozen or so years, I couldn't understand what everybody said. You know, we, we'd talk, uh, um, and, uh, um, but whenever I'd visit him, I'd dig out his manuscript and I'd you know, read, read it you know, in the manuscript form. And so I had the opportunity to um, discuss everything with him. And uh, over a number of years, gradually, um, uh, although he taught me meditation, uh, and I did what he was showing me for about a dozen years, I got nowhere. I got absolutely nowhere. You know. um, uh, but I put a lot of effort in. I was trying all, all kinds of things. What he showed me, I was reading um, uh, uh, Mayana Buddhism, trying some of those techniques, uh, all kinds of things. Um, and I was... Um, uh, what, what turned the corner for me, I went off to one of these Vipassana courses. You know, I don't. I don't recommend for passing to anybody. You know, it's a forcing technique, and it gets people into trouble. It's a good technique, <laughs> you know, if you know what you're doing. But the people who conduct these courses, they're fuckwits. You know, I've seen people. I've seen people uh, uh, mentally disturbed afterwards because they they just, they just don't understand what they're doing. Um, but because I'd um, already been practicing for a while, and I and I had. Uh, by this stage, a pretty good philosophical grounding. Khan was, um, um, he studied all of the Indian traditions. Uh, um, he, he could talk about them a little more. Okay. Um, uh, after, after, I spent 10 years involved in Third Island Buddhism. And the first five years, it took me five years to understand what they're on about. And then I spent the next five years arguing with them. Right? And they basically didn't want to see me. I'm, I'm a bit, I'm a bit of a hard case. Um, there's a lot of, I find a lot of um, um, internal inconsistencies in the philosophy, which they won't face up to. Then they won't debate. Right? So, well, the technique, um, uh, it gave me. Uh, I, I've, I was stuck to water with it, right? and well. Oh, this is what I was looking for. Uh, and uh, then um, my conversations uh, with Con over, you know, subsequent over the, the next several years were much higher order. Uh, and uh, towards the end, um, I believe I understood pretty much what he was trying to tell me. Uh, so I felt pretty confident I could edit his book when he died because I knew what he wanted to say. And there were a lot of notes to it. Like there was the original manuscript, 
Um, he, um, he had a tragedy in his life. He died just before he was 80. He was a smoker, World War II, right? He was a puffer, right? Okay. Um, when he was 71, I helped him move flat, right? And I was still a strong young man. And here's this guy, he didn't even, he was Georgia size, not a tall man. Strong. Strong. Um, he was stronger and fitter than I'd ever been. Right? And he was practicing his yoga. Right? Okay. Um, a couple of years after that, you know, 73, 74, he woke up one morning blind. Couldn't see a thing. What had happened was the blood vessels inside his eye leaked and clouded his vision. Now eventually it partially clears up. And um, for the last six, six years of his life, uh, he was working a typewriter, but uh, he could see, he, they uh, made some glasses for him, one, one, one lens was all smoked over, and so there was one eye that directed the light to the periphery, because the, you know, the, the cladiness is in the centre of the eye, but you can still get peripheral vision. So the, the lenses that would bend the end of the he could read, and he'd read like this. Now he, produ he produced a box full of notes to this text after he was blind, and um, uh, and his his, his um, thought kept on maturing the whole time. This was his final word on what he thought yoga was. If he, was, you know, if he had more years to live, he probably would have refined it even further. Yeah. So, did he have a, a particular? Uh, affinity with this? Is that why he did this one, or he just felt that it was uh, hadn't been really uh, done justice in its translation? Or more, more of that. Um, uh, he found uh, he found what, um, I, and I agree with him, um, some very poor translation of difficult text. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a um, uh, the the authority commentator is a fellow called Vyasa. Now, Vyasa just means writer, right? The name of the actual person, who knows? Uh, and I think it's 3rd century AD. And all translations follow the commentary of Vyasa. And by, by and large, it's okay. Right? Except in the really difficult part of what is samadhi, what is naroda, the final stage of meditation. Which, you know, it's kind of crucial, and um, he objected in the strongest terms that the translation that is accepted is wrong. It's not what the text says; it says something totally different. Um, but you can only understand that if you are a meditator, and if you at least you know, approach that level of, of, of experience, you know? uh, and it's. Um, uh, also, there's this tendency in Hindu philosophy has got a reputation for it, for incorporating all kinds of you know, extraneous stuff, and wishful thinking, and magical thinking, you know, and it pollutes just a straight translation because there's a wish of oh, what this to be true, um, and so that was the reason why. It, progressed from him doing his own translation for his own knowledge to, oh, I'm going to write a book about this. And, um, uh, uh, yeah, so he didn't succeed in getting it published while he was alive. It, uh, it almost was published by the Theosophical Theos Society. Um, but this is, this is actually only one section. He wrote quite a wide, wide ranging book because he wasn't just interested in yoga, he was, he was a competent astrologer, uh, he was a competent Egyptologist. Um, uh, he, uh, he mentions in some of his commentary, uh, he was involved with um, trans mediums, uh, which was a thing after the war. I don't know what to think about it, but he believed in it. Um, and um, uh, so he produced quite a comprehensive book. Now, one of the reasons that the Theosophical Society wouldn't publish it, I suspect, and this is what he suspected, uh, is that um, he mentions uh, um, Krishnamurti. 
Now, he was in Sydney when the Theosophical Society built a big um, um, uh, stadium, well, you know, uh, not stadium, uh, you know, seats on, on what's this called, I don't know what it's called, overlooking the Sydney Harbour, uh, facing the Sydney Harbour, where they're going to have all these dignitaries sit and they were going to uh, introduce Krishnamurti, the Theosophical, Theosophical Society, introduce Krishnamurti as the return to Jesus, the saviour. And he was, to prove it, he was going to hop out of the boat and walk across the water to the shore and everybody was going to, going to clap, right? And that was, uh, up until that point, you know, that's, uh, I think, what triggered Krishnamurti saying, oh, I'm not doing that, uh, and turned his whole back on the Theosophical Society uh, and but proceeded to... You know, become a teacher in, in his own right in meditation. Well, the Theosophical Society wishes to disown that whole episode. And he you know, put it in his book. Now, if they read the book and, and found you know, and saw that, they weren't going to publish. <laughs> no way. Now, no one was going to publish his book. Um, but of his, um, uh, of his own translation, is Samadhi... Uh, as, as he has translated it, potentially the, the closest or most accurate? That he I has think or? it's, uh, look, I'm going to make a bold claim. It's yeah. correct. What he says is correct. Mm -hmm. um, the, the objection that he, that he, uh, that he has, uh, and it's in the Vibhuti Bhada that it comes up, Vibhuti um, Bhada 3, 3 to onto 3, 9, uh, uh, you know, the third sutra to the ninth sutra of the, of the third part. Um, meditation, according to Yoga Sutra, is explained as a three step process. The first step is withdrawal of the senses. Basically, detachment, but to the point where uh, you withdraw from experience to the best of your ability, not get drawn into, into things, trying just to um, narrow the focus of your attention. Then you refine that into one-pointed meditation. And one-pointed meditation is specifically um, um, explained as the image presented in the mind is the same as the previous image presented in the mind. So going back to this early psychology, how we uh, have you know, present uh, images overload. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, each of those images are subtly different, and we, we merge them into a final thing. One pointedness is the same image repeated constantly. That's one pointedness. Right? Uh, and then the final stage of, of, uh, of meditation is that you then drop that. You have no images in the world represented in the mind. So to, to get to that ability to drop images, you need to be able to get to the point where you can constrict it to a single image. <coughs> now, once again, that's a forcing um, meditation practice. Uh, uh, Hatha yoga is a forcing technique. It's meant to produce a result. Uh, and these um, and it's very similar to the Theravada, um, the underlying uh, um, methods of Theravadan meditation is very much based on that. You know, we've got this access meditation and then so on, but it's a narrowing of perception to one point of this, leading to uh, 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 insight. Okay, but there's a final stage, as I said earlier, there's Niroda and Nibbana. Right? They're identical states with different terms. Coming, Nibbana is the Buddhist term, Niroda is the, and that's where the image presented in the mind ceases. Right? Now that's the final stage of yogic meditation. But the way uh, that it's translated by Vyasa, and just about every text you will find follows Vyasa, is um, that there's some kind of remnant impression still left. There's a, um, um, the, uh, I'd have to read it to, to I don't know if might do it. Just to, just to be accurate here. Um, I'll read you his commentary here. 
this is commentary for um, 3.3. 3. Uh, the sutra reads the same, the steady one-pointed concentration of the foregoing sutra, is as if with the object simply fading away, as if its essential image were to become void of samadhi. Is that comprehensible? Yeah. It's a bit tangled, the wording, but... Okay, now his commentary. Right? And this is the whole purpose of why this book was written, right, or published. Yeah. Um, this radically different translation of 3.3 will shock other experts on the Yoga Sutra. It completely reverses the accepted meaning. It is, nevertheless, the only correct and meaningful translation. Once one-pointed concentration is achieved, momentary episodes of neuroda, samadhi, suspended mind, absence of mental uh, formations in brackets, begin to spontaneously occur. Now, yeah, just to just to explain that, right? you've got a similar similar um, explanation in Theravada Buddhism as well. Okay, you've got these images presented in the mind, but they're discrete images meaning there's a, a gap between the screen. So that gap is where you get the suspension, that's why the suspension of mind is possible. And the uh, um, assertion being made by yoga is it's possible to extend that gap. Right? And so when there's a gap, there's no image in the mind. Right? And that's, the, that's as far as you can take meditation. Uh, another way of looking at meditation, you're actually exploring the limits of what conscious experience can be. Right? You know, this is as far as you can actually take your mind right? to those absence of experience. That's it. Can't, there's nothing beyond that. You can't do anything else with your mind. Right? Okay, so... Um, in, the, uh, in the yoga classes that we do here, we, we um, experience all those elements, you know, the concentration, which is a single point, and uh, you translate that to zero point, which becomes meditation, uh, and then the, the, the final element is absorption. There is no separation between uh, yourself and everything else that you absorb. Uh, okay, but John. Um, uh, one one thing that characterizes the uh, neurotic state is that there's you don't experience it. Right? It's nothing that you actually experience. You only become aware when you emerge from it that you've been in that state because it's a suspended emotion <coughs> state. There's actually uh, examples of it happening spontaneously to people. Um, about 30 years ago, there was a major earthquake in the Philippines, and the hotel collapsed. And about eight or nine days later, they're still digging people out, and they take this person out, pronounce dead, take it to the morgue, and he wakes up. Yeah. Now, what had happened there is that he was buried totally. I mean, no breathing, no, buried. Okay, there's a there's a last ditch survival mechanism in the body. You go to the suspended state, and the there's. Yoga talks about an energy body. Well, it's real. The body will live off this minimal energy state. And everything ceases. You, you stop draining the energy just to survive. And it's a last-ditch attempt in the hope of rescue. Right? And like there, there are stories in England you know, opening up coffins, reusing grave sites, so they find people been scratching the inside. Well, some people have been taken for dead, buried. And they've been in the suspended animation state, and the energy level then has dropped down to that critical level where you know you've got to wake up because there's nothing left. <coughs> and that's what happened to this guy in the wall. He was in the suspended state, he wakes up because the energy level drops to that critical point, but he's, he can breathe, he's up, he carried on his life. So, uh, and there's all kinds of. <coughs> pardon me. Um, extreme states that yoga professors exist. And we got a modern day example. Wim Hof has become very popular. He's climbing the mountain with no clothes on, you know, and he's got, he got imitators. There's some other guy now that swims under, under, under ice for 20 minutes on a single breath. 
Uh, so there are these extreme capabilities. Uh, now, um, the, the yoga with the, uh, with the meditation, uh, it's trying to exploit that state. Okay, now, a really technical point here. Talking about the different um, interpretation that Buddhism puts on Nirvana and says, oh, well, there you go, that proves there's no, no self. Because where are you? You know what happened. The other one is the Rhoda, same state, Yoga says, that's proof there's a self. Okay, why Yoga makes that claim is because when you emerge out of that state, right, you consciously see yourself emerge from that state. Okay, you don't have, you don't have um, uh, the sense like you don't know where you are straight away, but you see your mind come alive. Wake up. You witness it. Well, how is that possible if there's not a witness? So yoga makes the claim there's something witnessing the mind. So yoga takes this ultimate state. There you go. You've now got living proof that you're, that you're uh, an indwelling self witnessing the mind. Because when you emerge from this state, that's what happens. You see it. Right? Now, unfortunately, it's a very attenuated state. Right? Of all the people who, who meditate, very, very few are ever going to get to that level because of the effort involved. Right? But that doesn't mean there's not something you can get out of the yoga. And we're only you know, 21 sutras in. Uh, it gets practical. There's a lot of practical use there, um, which you know. Once again, I'm going to uh, you know, highlight Buddhism. There's a lot of parallels in the Buddhist psychology. Um, if you exclude their cosmology and, and what they believe to be real, you exclude that just strictly their psychology. There's a lot of useful stuff there, and it's paralleled in the yoga. Um, and it comes from the practice of meditation. Um, uh, Should we finish up? Yeah, all right, we'll call it in there. Yeah, we've covered a lot of ground. Very good. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's been a privilege. Yes. Uh, in all my training, I didn't get this sort of instruction. I had to deal right. things out myself. Right. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of parallels there. Right. That's really Yeah, yeah well, um, I um, uh, if, if you're happy with that, I'm done. Otherwise, I'm quite happy to do more if you want to do another, another, another evening of deep and dark journey. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're doing uh, Friday evening, probably for a different group. Yeah, okay, different. We'll see group. how it goes. Yeah, well, it, it, it might be a different talk as well. Uh, yeah, cause yeah. Because it, um, yeah, it, it's interactive. Right? It, it, it's the audience. We, we have a conversation, not just a, not just a seminar. Yeah. But that's yoga oh, philosophy. That one again, the, the, the bodiless ones, the ah, buried in gross matter. Gross matter. Oh. Yeah, yeah, a technical <laughs> description. <laughs> well, that's got explanations too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> we'll get into that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, that's all right. Yeah. Uh, none of this. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Namaste. Yeah, yeah, no, that's no, 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 it's, it's another, it's another pet hate of mine. Okay. Yeah. 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 Right. I hope you enjoy the uh, nice slightly song. different <laughs> session. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. I don't want to let you leave. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I said I'd do it. Yeah. Well, um, uh, if you're interested, you're welcome to keep the copies of the books that you've been handed. Oh, okay. Well, thank right. you. Right. If you, if you, you, have a read. you can have, uh, have if you if you find it interesting, and now that you've been alerted that 